Hi, this is Steve at BlessedHopeForever.com. Thank you for joining us once again. An attack on Christianity has begun in this country that's uh, really unprecedented. It's never before, it's never before been seen in our generation, uh, perhaps in uh, the history of the country. These folks have always believed that the rosary is a weapon uh, against uh, e evil. Uh, the non-believers have always believed that, but now they're taking it seriously. Uh, Christians are being branded as terrorists. Our Lord Jesus Christ is coming soon. We're 30 days away from September 18th, a day that will live in infamy, is at least as far as I'm concerned, because I see uh, a lot of potential for that being a possible rapture date. And then, of course, the Feast of Trumpets is September 28th. I want to talk a little bit about the Siege of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Uh, according to historians, it began on April the 14th. Um, went on for quite some time. Uh, the Jews eventually drew back to the temple as a final defense. Uh, you know, in looking at the end of the siege, the, the Jews surrounded, starving, uh, even resorting to cannibalism and yet they still observed the Holy Rite of Tamid. On August 5th, uh, the last of the two sacrificial lambs run out and they have nothing left to sacrifice. A few days later on August 10th, the Romans set fire to the inner chamber, uh, which uh, threatens to destroy the sacred texts and all of the priceless treasures and the last defenders, they just, they don't know whether to fight the flames or to fight the Roman uh, soldiers. So filled with fury and, and full of re revenge and, and animosity toward the Jews, the Romans, they, the soldiers they actually disobey their superiors and they begin killing women and children, uh, the elderly, the helpless, and any, anybody else who was unfortunate enough to to be there. And it virtually becomes a bloodbath. Uh, in fact, many, uh, many of the Jews were disemboweled to see, just to see if they had swallowed uh, priceless treasure. And of course then afterwards, uh, Titus, you know, he offers the sacrifice of an ox, uh, a sheep and a pig at the Eastern gate of the temple. And with that move, he consummates the domination of the, the Roman God over the God of the Jews. And the siege ends on September 8. We've been studying together in 1 Corinthians, uh, chapter 12, part 40, this is part 45. Uh, We've been looking at, at redemption, uh, deliverance, service, worship. Uh, we're, we're trying to keep in mind here that the Corinthians were carnal, that is, they were fleshly. Uh, there is a horse, historical context to this. They had no Bibles at that time. Uh, there was a lot of power in God's Word, whether it was written or spoken. And this is a body context. And the Holy Spirit, as we saw in the text, speaks through us. And it's God's will that we not be ignorant of these spiritual graces. And uh, we need to define terms. There is actual flesh, uh, birth according to the flesh. Uh, we read about that in Galatians chapter 4 and 5. We died to the law, the flesh, uh, the human merit, a world-based religious system based on human merit, the works of the flesh, is contrasted in scripture with the fruit of the spirit there is disobedience walking unworthily uh, not abiding in the vine uh, we are all members of one body it's uh, there's a spirit and flesh walk uh, there's a righteousness that's based on faith not on just uh, reading it and doing it and uh, and god desires we trust him above all else there's a belief in the truth uh, sanctify them in truth, thy word is truth. Now I read the other day that God separated Paul because he saw him uh, quite gifted. 
And, you know, actually the truth is that God worked in Paul to fit him to complete the Word of God. To complete it. And the Thessalonian uh, uh, believers were commended for taking the Word from Paul as what it was, which was truth, God's Word. And, folks, I don't have the ability to put into language for what we ought to comprehend. Can you imagine holding in your hand the word of the sovereign God? Everything, dearly beloved, that God wants you to know, he's put in this book. Thy word is truth. And I believe without question that it is the Holy Spirit and he alone who will guide you into all truth. He promised that he would. He also promised to, Jesus also promised to send him as a comforter. The Holy Spirit had John the Baptist say that I baptize you with water, but there comes one after me who will baptize you in the Holy Spirit, who will guide you into all truth. And all truth to me has to be this book, not something separate from this book. I believe with all my heart, I've always believed it, uh, that the Holy Spirit is the only one who will teach you truth. But he does it by the study of this book. You know, uh, I'm big on God's sovereignty, but God's sovereignty has nothing to do with you studying the Word. Why should we study, folks? Why should we study this book? You know, other than the fact that we're living in the last of the last of the last of the last days. Well, because God told us to. Is that such an amazing thing that a loving Heavenly Father said, study to show yourselves approved a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth? Should that surprise us? You know, and I've heard it uh, said, well, if God is sovereign, why do we go to the mission field? Well, because He told us to. Why preach the truth of, of His Word? God is sovereign. Folks, I, don't, I, I, I really seriously do not believe that anybody believes God is sovereign more than I do. Now, I could be wrong, but I absolutely believe God is sovereign. I absolutely believe God works all things after the counsel of His own will. So why come on here, this channel, and teach? because he told me to. I believe the, the church in our present age is moving further, drifting further and further and further and further away from the truth. I visited one church where the sermon was about 45 minutes long on a, a, a number of things that you had to do to go to heaven. You know, and every one of them was wrong. And the church was packed. How can we do that? You know, did anybody in that church read the Bible? I couldn't believe it. I, folks, I don't mean to be critical. I really don't. You know, but Billy Graham wrote a book, uh, How to Be Born Again. I suppose he wrote it. I don't know. I mean, maybe somebody else wrote it, put his name on it. But everything in it was wrong. And yet, thousands and thousands and thousands of copies have gone around the world. How do we do that? Does anybody read this book? You, you want to write a book telling me the many things that you must do in order to be your father's son? You know, I mean, it's, it's a silly thing to even suggest. What did the Son have to do with it? What did the Son in the first Passover have to do with it? The Scriptures declare I was born again by the will of God, not according to the flesh, not by the will of flesh, not by my will. It, it can't be by anything that I did. In Peter, it's God who caused you to be born again, caused you to be born again. We're going to be seeing something similar to that in our study today. 
Yet there's thousands of co copies of that book telling you on how you can do all that. God, God didn't do it. You know, four things, five things, six things, seven things you got to do to go to heaven. Well, the answer to how many, what do you have to do to go to heaven is nothing. Why? Because you're God's child. You always were God's child. You always were God's son or daughter. Always were. He caused you to be born again. There are sons of the devil, to be sure, but they'll never hear, they'll never believe, they'll never accept, they'll never repent, they'll never come. I hear people say, you know, well, we go to, we go, uh, to this church because our kids really love it. Believe me, I mean, if the kids enjoy it, they're not learning much. No, Steve, you're so cold-hearted. I mean, you know, these are just kids. Yeah, they're kids. Folks, this is not an entertainment channel. We're here to study, and Bible study is a discipline, and I, th I think we should be disciplined to look at what God said. We're running out of time. Why don't you believe me, he said, because you're not my sheep. Yet the predominant message today is, I can become a sheep if I believe. Uh, wait a minute, God just said, if I'm not a sheep, I can't believe. And somehow we reverse the process, we put the cart before the horse. We elevate man. We denigrate God. I don't know how we get away with it. I am more and more persuaded that most Christians believe what they believe because they sang it in a hymn book. You know, and to be honest, many hymns, many of them, not all of them, but many hymns aren't really all that good theologically. They aren't based on, on sound biblical doctrine. But they sure leave an impression on, on people's souls. I believe the Holy Spirit leads you into all truth. That's God's Word. And His, His process of doing that is through our studying to show ourselves approved, a workman that need not to be ashamed. If, dearly beloved, we don't study, I assume we'll pay a price for that. So I urge you, especially given the times we're in, to please give due diligence to this book. What does it say? My sheep hear my voice. Why do you not believe me? Because you're not my sheep. How can anybody then stand up and say that if you want to be God's sheep, you have to believe? When God himself says, if you're not my sheep, you cannot believe. If you are his sheep, one of his sheep, then you can believe. If you're not, you can't and never will. You never will believe. Only God's sheep can come to a, a knowledge of the truth and the Holy Spirit will guide you into all truth. He did that with the Corinthians church here that we're looking at he's doing it today but there's a distinction that we have to take note of here so we're in corinthians chapter 12 we have a bunch of gifts given verses uh, 7 through 10 word of wisdom word of knowledge faith gifts now it's plural gifts of healing working of miracles plural prophecy discerning of spirits different kinds of tongues, interpretation of tongues. Now, as you go over to the eighth verse of chapter 13, and I'm not in chapter 13, I'm, we've got a ways to go before we get to chapter 13. But we see that love never fails. Charity is the way it's translated. Love never fails. But whether they be prophecies, they shall fail. Tongues, they shall cease and so forth. So we have the modern Christian community dividing these gifts into the sign gifts and the permanent gifts. Now you have those extremists on the one side that are, well, they're just, it's, they, there's no division at all. And I mentioned in the last video, I suggested that all of these gifts were given to facilitate the completion of the Word of God. 
You have to keep that in the forefront of your thinking as you're going through this. All right, and I'll do my best to support that when we get into chapter 13. You know, I, I recognize that there are, well, there's, there's other applications to that verse, but time and time again, we're told that the sign gifts, uh, uh, healing, miracles, prophecy, discerning of spirits, tongues and interpretation of tongues, that they'll all cease. And we can prove that in the eighth verse of the 13th chapter. But love doesn't fail. Never will. But if there are prophecies, there's, there's, there's one that, that'll fail. Tongues, well, they shall cease. But notice what the text, the next one is. Knowledge. It's going to vanish away. Well, how could it possibly have vanished? How could that be? I have knowledge today. How could, how could it have vanished? So, Steve, you don't tell me that's one of the sign gifts that's, that's vanished. Well, yeah, it is. All right. The distinction that we're looking at here is not, it's not that knowledge itself has vanished entirely, but in the context of what we're looking at, the knowledge of those, those temporary sign gifts in the sense that it was given then has vanished. The knowledge has not vanished in the sense that we have that in His Word. What, what vanished was the knowledge that was given apart from the Word, the completed Word, because they didn't have the completed Word. I hope that makes sense. I hope I didn't totally make a mess of that and turn that into a, a massive confusion. But that's how I'm looking at the text, folks. There's something very dynamic taking place here. We don't want to, we don't want to underestimate the working of God, the Holy Spirit, in the early church before there was a Bible, okay? What I've been trying to suggest is, is that I believe we're in a context where these gifts had a specific purpose and that it looked forward to the completion of the Word of God in, in the body of Christ. We saw in our study through Ephesians, he gave some ministers, pastors, uh, teachers, uh, and so on and so forth. I believe there we are looking at the permanent gifts that we have in the church. And these gifts also come through the Word of God. I believe that the, these uh, we are looking at here were specific gifts to complete the Word of God. They served the purpose for which they intended because... Uh, simply because they did not at that time have the complete Word of God. Don't underestimate the power of the Word of God. But we, we now have the Word of God. So therefore they ceased. We don't need them because we have the complete Word of God. Verse 11. And once again, I don't ask anyone to agree with me. Verse 11, but all these worketh that one and the self same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he, God, wills. Okay. That is God speaking to the Corinthian church before they ever had what we call a Bible. So just stop and think, all right? How are we to understand those words today in the year 2022? I'm going to suggest that we all, every one of us, possess those spiritual graces in the sense that we have God's complete Word today. How do we have a sense of discernment? Well, God's Word. 
How do we understand prophecies? God's Word. He's given them to every man. That's every man. And they're appropriate today. They just don't come to us in the same way as they did before the Word of God was complete. Imagine being a Christian and not having a Bible. I mean, it's, it's kind of hard for us to imagine. But I don't think we've spent much time thinking about that. Most conservative theologians at least say, well, the sign gifts are no longer operative and there's all kinds of articles and books written on, you know, and all kinds of evidence given that there's no single established event whereby anybody speaking in tongues actually spoke in a known language. And, uh, well, well, Pentecostalism, they, they get, gets around that by suggesting that it's a heavenly language. And folks, there's no such thing as prayer tongues in Scripture. So when we get to heaven, we'll just really, I guess, we'll just mumble around and not make any sense. No. No, folks, these were divided to every man severally as God would, as God willed. We are looking at a sovereign God. You know, not it's, it isn't because someone wanted this, that, or the other gift. It's not that you want this, that, or the other gift, and maybe you may seek after this, this gift and that gift. You're, you're encouraged to seek after these gifts, but it was the sovereign God, and that sovereign God has given us His Word today. How much do you study? I'm absolutely convinced that if Christ stood in front of you today, He'd have nothing to say to you that He hasn't already said in His Word. This book is the testimony of Jesus Christ. It's the truth God wants us to know. He will guide you into all truth. And folks, clearly the context, the context, clearly the context, the subject is God's truth. You know, I do try to discipline myself you know, to do Bible study. But I'm not setting myself, uh, myself up as some kind of, you know, supreme example, some kind of model of that. M many of you probably spend more time in the Word than I do. What I'm trying to say is without study, I don't think the Holy Spirit leads you into any truth. That's just my opinion. These gifts were divided according to the sovereign will of God at a particular time in which they were absolutely necessary. He did that. Verse 12, as the body is one and has many members, all the members of that one body being many are one body. I believe of the body of Christ, Jew and Gentile in the body of Christ is something that was not revealed in the Old Testament. Most, most Bible scholars believe that. There was a mystery, Christ in you, the hope of glory, a mystery that was not revealed in previous generations. What I don't believe, I. I do not believe there is even a hint of Jew and Gentile being one body in Christ in the Old Testament. Without question, I believe there are promises to the nation of Israel and the nation of Israel will be a blessing to the Gentile nations. But we're talking about a spiritual body in Christ, not earthly, not a nation whose blessings are earthly. A spiritual body in Christ, Jew and Gentile, slave and free, in one body in Christ. The Lord Jesus Christ said, I will build my church. Not that I am building my church. I will build my church. I believe that happened at Pentecost. I believe that it is the disciples who spoke in tongues, not all of these other people. They heard these, the people heard these, these disciples speaking in their own language. Okay.
I'm reminded of Peter. Uh, I, says Peter, the word of the Lord. I, I, how? Well, let's look at John. John the, baptized you with water, but you shall be baptized in the Holy Spirit. When did that happen? When did that happen? Well, most uh, of the church today believes that happens when you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. I can't help but believe that it happened at Pentecost, and that's going to be important for just a moment. Verse 13, For in one spirit we are all baptized into that one body. Okay? Go over to Acts 15. You're going to see that after they had held their peace, James answered saying, uh, you know, listen to me. Uh, how, how God at the first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Well, when was that? When was that? When did God visit to take the Gentiles out as a people for his name? Well, you could say, you know, any time during his earthly ministry. I believe it was at Pentecost. The Gentiles, after hearing the word in their own language, it never happened before. The scriptures were proclaimed in Hebrew in a Jewish temple. So I think it happened at Pentecost. And our text says that for by one spirit we were all baptized into one body. Okay? The preposition there is the is uh, new uh, is epsilon nu, the word in. The, the, the preposition can be translated in. If you believe the Holy Spirit is the baptizer, you can translate it by. Uh, for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. We all have been. It's an aorist passive. It's a finished transaction. You had nothing to do with it. It included all of those at Pentecost, including you. Every single member of the body of Christ was identified, that is, baptized into the one body of Christ and not by anything that they did. They didn't ask to be. It wasn't because they asked uh, God, to, uh, asked or accepted or repented or received or, or made Jesus Lord of their life or any of that other stuff. They didn't do any of that. They were baptized now, well, were they baptized by the Holy Spirit or in the Holy Spirit? Well, he that comes after me, said John the Baptist, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and with fire or in the Holy Spirit with fire. So I believe the baptizer is not the Spirit, but it, the baptizer is Christ. Unless I don't understand Matthew chapter 3. Now, if the baptizer is Christ... All right, then I have to take the preposition in, epsilon nu there in the Greek, to say that I was baptized with or in the one spirit. Now, most Christians know, you, you hear it quoted all the time, that we were baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. And most people believe that. And that may be right, folks, that may be right. I'm not saying it isn't, and I'm not asking anyone to agree with me. What I'm saying is, I'm, I'm saying what I, I, what I read in Matthew chapter 3, and when I look at the prepositions, I think that the baptizer is Christ. Now, you don't have to agree with me on that, but I believe that the baptizer is Christ. I believe the text is saying that Jesus Christ, God incarnate, baptized us in the Holy Spirit into one body. All right. And, and I believe that occurred at Pentecost. And he was able to do that because he died in our place. I believe when Jesus Christ died in your place. I and mean, now the word there is in the Greek is huper. When Christ died as your substitute is what the, the grammar, the text says, the actual text says. You are identified in the body of Christ. 
that word baptizo speaks of anything where you come under the control of something else. I understand there's, we were baptized into his death, we were baptized into his body, these are, these are different things, but uh, that, this is why I often use the word identify, baptizo, okay? The sovereign God in the incarnate Christ identified us into one body in the Holy Spirit, whether we are Jews, Gentiles, bond or free, and we've been made, we've been made, folks, Highlight your text, please, okay? Made. Passive voice. We didn't do it. We've been made to drink of that one spirit. Made to drink. And I believe that that's this book. I don't know how to put it in any better language. There isn't a more treasured possession, folks, that you have as far as I'm concerned than this book. And these are not Paul's words. They're not, this is not Paul's logic. This is not Paul's reasoning. This is God's word. And this is what God wants us to know. How, how wonderful, how amazing to realize that Jesus Christ died once, just once, in the place of every Christian who would ever live. He died for you. He died for me. He died for our children and our children's children. It's a done transaction. Aorist passive. It's finished. He did it. What a wonderful truth. What, what a wonderful truth, folks, to rest in. What, what peace, what joy. And to all the missionaries out there, God bless you. But listen to me. In the midst of all your your sorrow, your, your weariness, your worry, your frustration, your hardship. Remember that not one child of God will wind up in hell and not one child of Satan who is not God's will wind up in heaven. And you can rest on that. And when I say that, well, I expect there to be some who never come back to this channel. But folks, dearly beloved, I think that's wonderful. What kind of people worship a God who may or may not be able to take his children to heaven? What kind of, what kind of God is that? I don't want a father like that. The God we worship is, a, is the sovereign monarch of eternity. He has his children, but Satan has his. You know, the disciples came and told him, you, you said to, to Jesus, you sowed bad seeds. He said, I didn't do that. An enemy has done this. Who sowed the terror, folks? Who sowed the terror? Satan. What did God sow? Wheat. Every plant which my Father hath not planted shall be rooted up. What does that say? Well, it says that every plant that he did plant won't be rooted up. It can't be rooted up. You were planted as wheat. You were planted as wheat. You'll grow as wheat. You'll be harvested as wheat. And you never were a tear. It's like you're a sheep. You never were a goat. You were never, never, never a child of Satan. And yet popular preaching today says if you wanted to, well, you could move from Satan's domain, from Satan's family to God's family. I, how do, how do I do that? How do I do that? I, I didn't choose to be my father's child. I didn't elect to be born by my dad and my mother. I didn't elect to be born again from above by God. I am his, folks, and I have been identified in his body, and I will never, never perish. And if you are his and he, you belong to him, neither will you. Let's have a word of prayer. Gracious Father, we, we thank you so much for all of your wonderful blessings, the gifts that you've bestowed upon us, the opportunity you've given us to study your word together, to come together, to feast together on your word, to feast together on Christ and what he's done for us. I ask that you would filter out all the foolishness, seal to our hearts that which is truth, 
For it's in Christ's name I pray. Amen. I love you all. I truly do. Thanks for watching.